For we know you're the only one who sees You can open up their eyes And they'll raise their voice To praise you with a grateful heart I praise you with a grateful soul With all my might and all my strength I live for you I praise you with a thankful heart. I praise you with a thankful soul. With all my mind and all my strength, I sing to you with a grateful heart. have opened up my eyes and I'll raise my voice to praise you with a grateful heart. I'll praise you with a grateful soul. With all my might and all my strength, I'll live for you. I'll praise you with a thankful heart. I'll praise you with a thankful with all my might and all my strength, I'll sing to you with a grateful heart. That's what we are here to do this morning, and that is to praise the Lord with a grateful heart. I trust that you've had a great Thanksgiving. If you were here Wednesday night with us, we had a wonderful service of Thanksgiving, but we are here to give thanks to God each and every Sunday. Before we worship, though, I would like to introduce to you two guests we have with us today. Laurie was singing with her brother Steve up here, and this is her sister-in-law, Nikki, and they're joining us on the worship team this morning. And I just love how the Lord puts everything together. He has knitted this team together this morning, and we are here to give him praise. Let's stand together as we sing the only name yours will be. This is the name we're going to praise for eternity. favor I seek, the only name that matters to me. 
church. It, that was all right, huh? That was all right. <laughs> I'm really glad that you're all here this morning. I'm Anne McQuiston. I'm the outreach director here. One of the things that I do is I help to um, facilitate everyone getting to know each other, to build relationships, to live in community the way the church did in Acts. So with that in mind, I want to let you know that in two weeks on December 13th, right? Yes. <laughs> We are going to be having a soup and sandwich luncheon, um, just a time of fellowship, um, a way to celebrate the holidays together. I know in the past we've had like a big like ham or turkey or something dinner, but really how many of those can we eat during the holiday season? So we're gonna keep it a little light. We're gonna have soup and sandwiches, a great time of fellowship. Uh, only thing we need to know is how many of you are coming. So if you could sign up at the back at the end of the service, that'd be really great. And it's just gonna be $3 to cover the cost of that food also a great opportunity to invite a friend. Um, the other thing that I want to remind you about is the tear-off sheet in the bulletin. That's a communication card. If the, you have any prayer requests, you can write them on there. Um, look over that. If there's anything you want to volunteer for or um, you want to talk with pastor or any of the staff, just mark it on there and we'll be sure to get back in touch with you. Thank you. This 
This Wednesday night at 7.30, we will meet in the sanctuary if you've signed up for choir. We're going to do a short season this year for Christmas only. And the other announcement I'm supposed to make is about Bible quiz. We are having a Bible quiz meet this coming Saturday at the church. That will start at 9 o'clock with, wor- with worship. And then it's, the meet starts at 10. But we are, I believe, in need of some volunteers to help serve or... Okay. So if you... <laughs> Mm-hmm. All right, so if you would like to volunteer to serve, you can see Becky Groves, but all, Becky, wave, wave your hand. I think everyone knows Becky. But also, too, we are in need of cookies, cakes, brownies. These people love to eat desserts. And, <laughs> and I just want to give you a little, little secret. We actually, our church is probably one of the best when it comes to the food with, with these meats. So let's, let's just keep that tradition going. But come out and support these kids. They study the scripture so hard, and they just love to see your faces supporting them. And I'm also here to tell you today, God's, God sent his son Jesus, and that is called Amazing Grace. Stand with us as we sing, This is Amazing Grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? So much stronger, the King of glory, the King of all the kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in love and wonder, the King of glory, the King of all the kings. This is amazing grace.
And we sing with joyful hearts for, and with thanksgiving for the sacrifice you made for us, that you bear our cross, that you bear all of our sin, and in grace you give us eternal life. Oh, Lord, we worship you this morning. We pray this morning that your Holy Spirit's presence would fill this room, that each and every soul in here would be touched by your presence, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. Let us experience 
the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your prayer. team for leading us in those wonderful songs of truth and petition for the spirit of the living God to fall fresh on us. You know, that's a real good introduction to what we're going to be preaching about over the next several weeks. The Christmas, the, the Christmas songs, uh, the songs of Christmas, and uh, every, each and every person who was involved in that fantastic story of Christ coming to earth the first time in the flesh was moved mightily by the spirit of God. Uh, in, coming into the presence of God was surprised. Many of them thought they were beyond uh, the reach of God even to be used and how surprised they were when they were called upon by God to do something special in the account of bringing Jesus into the world the first time. What powerful reminders. And I hope uh, truthfully that your heart is in a place where you're seeking some something new from God as we come into the Christmas season. You know, it can become very mundane and it can become the same thing. I was reminded of it actually when I was coming home Friday uh, and I decided instead of going um, west on 90 and getting off south on 79, I would take a shortcut and come down Peach Street Friday. Forgot what day it was. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. You know, and I'm wondering about all these people out there, you know, wrapped up in, in the busyness of the shopping and, and the running here and there and all these things, and yet missing uh, the true meaning of Christmas, missing out on an opportunity to come into the very presence of God, maybe for the first time for many of them. So let's keep that in mind as we go through the Christmas season. Would you join your hearts with mine as we seek the Lord together once again in prayer? Precious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this opportunity to come together at East Lake Road Alliance Church uh, on this, the last Sunday of November 2015. 
Lord, we thank you for the week that uh, it was behind us. We thank you so much for what we experienced in our Thanksgiving Eve service. Oh, we know that God is real. We know that God is moving in the lives of people because we heard it, Lord God, from so many. We thank you for the fact that you are, Lord Jesus, active and alive in this world. Even when it seems like, Lord God, things are spinning completely and totally out of control, we know that you are sovereign in all things. You are in control, and your will will be done. How we thank you for those truths that we can stand on, Lord Jesus. And as we go through our time together this morning, Lord God, we, we've already asked you to fill this place with your Holy Spirit's presence. We pray that each and every one of us, Lord God, would be met by you right at our point of need. And Lord Jesus, that you would change us by your presence with us. We're reminded that several of our people are traveling this morning, Lord God, this day before the first day of deer season in Pennsylvania. So many of our men and women are gone. We pray, Lord God, that you would be with them right where they're at, that they too might sense in a very real way your Holy Spirit's presence with them. Once again, we're reminded of our elderly, Lord God, our shut-ins. So many, uh, Lord God, of our congregation uh, are elderly and would love to be out today, would the deepest desire of their heart is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. But for physical reasons and other reasons, they simply can't be here. doesn't stop your spirit from visiting them, though. We ask you, Lord God, to be very real to our shut-ins. Lord, as we lift them to heaven right now, we pray that you would bless them and keep them and that they would sense in a very real way your Holy Spirit's presence with them. And we pray, Lord God, that as we go through the rest of our time together here this morning, that as we continue to lift Jesus in this place, that every one of us would be drawn closer to him. Lord, we pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified here this morning, and that as he is, we would be changed by that presence. We pray all of these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and our soon-coming King. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, Amen, amen, and amen. We're going to ask the men to come forward to prepare to collect the morning tithes and offerings. Don't forget to put that uh, little card that's in your bulletin. Uh, fill it out and get it in the offering plate. If you have any questions about anything about the church, we'd like to answer them for you. Now, we're also wrapping up our Great Commission Fund giving for the year. We extended it a little bit uh, because we had some communication gaps, but you know what? Even in that, God was in control, and we've got some wonderful, wonderful news. Lou's going to come up and share with you what's been going on in our Great Commission Fund giving this year. Oh, this is exciting. This is ex really exciting. exciting, right? Very exciting. The church should be full to hear yeah. this, right? Maybe yeah. the next service. You guys Amen. should be sitting down for this. Amen. But afterwards, we should be giving a, a word of praise. Amen. Uh, as you may know, last week we wrapped up our Great Commission Fund giving for 2014-2015. And uh, before I tell you the results, we'll talk about last year. Last year, 2013-2014, our goal as a church was $45,000. So do we have that slide up there? So last year, we slightly exceeded our goal of, at 48, 8, 45, 8, 90, 32, which was a record for East Lake Road Alliance Church. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. So this year, as a, as a church, we decided that we'll, we'll increase, we always want to increase our, uh, our goal. So we set the goal at $46,000. So at the end of October, which was technically the end of the giving uh, period, we were 9% we were short of our goal at 41,874. So, uh, you have to be sitting down for this. <laughs> so at the end, so after, yes, after last week's giving, our total for the giving year is... <laughs> over the goal. Actually, 25, we'll say 24% over our, our, the end of the term. Wow. So praise the Lord for your faithfulness. Amen. And, it's a key, and as far as a Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, giving to the Great Commission Fund is a key indicator of health in a church. So we've, we've ranged anywhere from 18% of our total income to we're around 11, but it's going to be more than that after this season. So praise the Lord. That is, that is something to be excited about because that's, that's the money that we use as a church to support our missionaries and our missionary efforts around the world. 
So thank you so much for your generosity. And, uh, you know, I've shared with you before, I, I was brought up by an elderly pastor, the, the man who actually led me to the Lord himself, Melvin Nicholson, who always told our congregation that he believed a church would be blessed by God directly in proportion to their Great Commission Fund giving. Now, I believe that is biblical because the heart of the Lord is to spread the good news. And that's how we do it. One of the ways that we do it is a CNMA church. So we can expect great and mighty things from a great and mighty God who always gives good gifts to his obedient children. Larry, would you ask a blessing on the offering this morning? We're now going to kick off our Christmas season music by bringing an offering of worship to our King. Okay, kids, would you like to go to junior church? All right.
I love the Christmas music. We're going to be starting singing some of the carols, and the, over the next few weeks we'll get really uh, involved in singing those Christmas songs. We're going to be bringing to you now some messages from uh, the Gospel of Luke that are the original Christmas songs, looking at some of uh, the original Christmas carols. Today we're going to look at Zachariah's song. Next week we'll look at the angel and the shepherd's song. We'll be looking at Mary's song, one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the next few weeks, and then we'll look at Simeon's song as we close this series out. So we're taking a little a detour from our Walk of Faith series with Abraham. But you know what's interesting? Even as you look at these passages of Scripture, it's all a walk of faith. At some point, we have to drop uh, all of our uh, questions, doubts, even our fears, and we have to get into a walk of faith. So it's really all a walk of, of faith as we look at the scriptures that we have before us. These songs of praise, again, are recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And they've been referred to as really the last of the Hebrew Psalms and the first of the Christian hymns. And it really links our faith, our Christianity, back to our Hebrew roots. And the songs that we're going to be looking at remind us of this, that the gospel itself, the good news of Jesus Christ itself, is indeed musical. We realize that what God has done, what He is doing, what He will do, has always been celebrated in some type of a song. Even in eternity, there will be songs of praise lifted to the Lord for all of eternity. If you don't believe me, go to the book of Revelation and read it. Wonderful, wonderful truth that the songs of the Lord are going to be celebrated for eternity. Now, what we're going to do today is look at the lyrics of Zechariah's song. We find that in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through about 79, if you want to turn in your Bibles there. Actually, we're going to be looking at some of the background first uh, before we get into that. We need to get behind the music for a few minutes to get the backstory on Zechariah and his situation, to really appreciate, to really appreciate what he says as he lifts a song of praise to God. So let's look at the background. Imagine with me, if you will, I like to try to get you to get back into the the um, situation that was going on. Imagine if you lived in Zechariah's time, no message from God for a long time. Of course, they didn't have any of the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. But there was silence from above. We know that between the Old and the New Testaments, God's people had been waiting for 400 years to hear from Him. No prophet spoke. No new revelation from the Lord. 400 years. During these times that we know now, or we call now, refer to now as the silent years, some of God's people were holding on to maybe their last bit of hope. Others we know were stuck in the ritual of religion and routine. Others were not even thinking about God anymore. We're not considering His promises anymore. King Herod ruled the land, and we know that he had built his idols we know that immorality was rampant. Spiritual life, even among God's people, had lost a lot of its vitality. And when you think about the conditions that Zachariah and Elizabeth were living in in that day, it kind of reminds you of where we're at in the United States of America today. So much of what we call faith in Christ has become ritual become mundane. It's become a, a matter of going through the motions. Now, if you'd like to follow along with me in the scripture about the background, I'm going to retell the account as found in Luke, actually, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, to set us up for what Zechariah proclaims in his song. He was a priest. We know that his wife, Elizabeth. They lived during this time of deep darkness and despair, and if one could color their lives, we might color it gray and gloomy. And the sky would be cloudy. 
<laughs> Much like a dull and dreary day, December day, I might add, in Erie, Pennsylvania. They had another silence in their life because they had no children. In that time, to not have a child was considered to be a curse, especially uh, in the uh, uh, nation of Israel or in the religion of, of the Israelites. Every Jewish couple, practically every Jewish couple, had the hopes that the Messiah would come from their family. So they felt left out. And their unmet desire surely must have led to unspoken despair in their lives. Pain would have described their psychological being probably very well. And we know today there are probably many people, even right here in, in this room, living with some kind of pain in their life, wondering how things turned out in their life the way they did. Maybe it's a wayward child, or maybe it's a loss of a loved one, the grief that comes with that. Maybe you're wondering how your finances went south so quickly, why your marriage ended up the way it did. Who knows? But like Zechariah, maybe you're here this morning and you've been waiting for something to change or for an answer you're not sure will ever come. And maybe in your life, heaven just seems to be silent. Well, the good news is like Zechariah, you may be hopeless and humiliated, but he is about to hear from God and the truth that he received and then proclaim can change your life this morning just like it changed his. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was hopeless, but he was about to hear some words that he could hardly believe. We know he was a priest, that he was one of probably about 20,000. And two weeks out of the year when his division was on duty, he would go up to Jerusalem for his temple responsibilities. This time, as he goes up to, to serve, he was chosen by lot to be the one to enter the holy place. And to be the one to burn incense outside the curtain to the Holy of Holies. This would have been a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it would have been a huge privilege for any priest. So Zechariah goes in and arranges the incense. And he offers prayers of intercession for the people. And while he is doing that. There is a multitude of worshipers out in the courtyard of the temple, and they're praying as well. They're waiting for him to come back and pronounce uh, the ironic blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and lift his countenance up to you and give you peace. But some, for some reason, Zachariah is delayed. As the smoke from the incense rises, He thinks he sees someone. And then he realized he was face to face with an angel. And he became afraid. Actually, the text, if you read it, says that he was gripped with fear. Now, we can only imagine. He was the only one in that place. Only him and the Lord. And all of a sudden, a presence appears. You can imagine the fear that must have gripped this man that day in that place. And then on the right side of the altar, which is really considered the side of favor, the angel Gabriel makes his presence known. His initial message, by the way, has two parts. And I love this about these things that the Lord does as he communicates with us. The first thing he says to Zechariah is this, do not be afraid. And isn't that something that whenever God appears to people in the Old Testament, he tells them to not be afraid? Because they're standing really in the presence of a loving and merciful God. Now, I think one of the problems that we have today in our society is that people don't have any fear of God at all. They just discount him altogether. They think that he's just this loving grandfather, sugar daddy, who's going to welcome everyone into heaven no matter what they do with his son, Jesus Christ. And there's no fear of this almighty God. Zechariah was gripped with fear. But when we stand in the presence of God, the first thing he says over and over and over again is, do not be afraid. And then he says, your prayer has been heard. They are going to have a son. 
And if you read verses 15 and 14, it explains, that the kind of, what, explains what kind of a man he would turn out to be. Verses 16 and 17 there describe the message he would preach. Among the jobs he would have would be to bring the people back to the Lord. So many had forgotten the promises of God. So many had given up on God ever speaking them again. He wants to bring the people, he is to bring the people back to the Lord. And then it says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Which is another thing we so desperately need in our culture today. You know, one of the things that thrilled my heart on Thanksgiving Eve, and if you weren't here, you really missed a blessing. I know that's a busy time of the year. But when we saw so many children participating in our service on Thanksgiving Eve, it thrilled my heart. Because there are fathers who are interested in turning their hearts to their children. And that's what the Word of God calls us to do. Men, you, we are called to turn our hearts to our children. And what that means, according to God's Word, is that we are to live our lives in such a way that God is primary in our lives. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is primary and our children see it. And then it says in verse 17, to make a people, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. One of John's responsibilities was to make a people ready to be prepared for the Lord. I used to preach a sermon, getting ready for Christmas. You know, if we want to get ready for Christmas, we really have to do what God's Word says we have to do. If we really want to be prepared for Christmas. And you know, John's message was quite simple. I believe it's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. His message was quite simple. It says, in those days, John came preaching in the desert. Now, again, remember, he's getting her people ready to receive the Lord. Jesus is coming. God is sending his son. His message was simple. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent. What's repent mean? It means change the way you think in such a way that it changed the way you act. People needed to change because the kingdom of God was near. It's a simple message. Don't keep going the way you're going. Go in a new direction. Prepare your heart and mind for the coming of the Lord. What a simple message. Yet another message that we don't hear too much anymore. What we hear today is that we're all doing fine. Everything's great. As long as you believe in something and you act on that belief, that's good enough. No, God's word says repent because the kingdom of God is near. Let me say this, dear hearts. The kingdom of God is very near. Just like it was near when John began to preach with the first coming of Christ, we expect the second coming of Christ. We have seen prophecy after prophecy fulfilled in our lifetime, our short lifetime. And Jesus' uh, first message is recorded for us, recorded for us shortly after that, Matthew chapter 4, 17. Now, if John said it and Jesus said it, it would be enough if just John said it, it was recorded for us, but the Lord himself said it. From that time on, after his baptism, Jesus began to preach what? The same message that John preached. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repentance is critical for anyone who is expecting to be prepared to meet the Lord. We cannot come to him with our minds fixed on the things of the world, with our lives operating under the world's standards, we must repent, we must change. Then Gabriel tells him that he's going to be a father in Luke 1.18, and Zechariah Zachariah immediately asks for some sort of a, a sign. He said, how can I be sure of this? I'm sure Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed for a child for a long time, for a son probably specifically. How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, he said, and my wife is well along in years. I love this interaction between the angel and Zechariah. It really shows you the difference between being connected with heaven and being connected with our circumstances and the world. The difference is incredible. Zechariah was saying to this agent of the Lord, I simply cannot believe it. 
That phrase there, I am an old man, is a very emphatic statement. And in verse 19, Gabriel responds by using the same type of emphatic expression. He says, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. It's as if Gabriel was saying to Zechariah, you might be an old man. I don't think they had the AARP in those days. But it's like you saying, listen, you may be old enough to get a senior coffee at McDonald's. You know, there are some blessings that come with being a senior citizen. I love getting a senior coffee at McDonald's. I tell Luke that when I was a young man, coffee used to be five cents. This is how old I am, right? Or ten cents a cup, and they kept filling it up for you. Who ever heard of paying this kind of money? For? But anyway... He says, I'm an old man, and my wife is an elderly woman. Gabriel's saying, what does that have to do with anything? I stand in the presence of God. See, Zechariah was fixed on the earth, the worldly things, things that he could see and touch that he knew from experience were true. Gabriel can't understand that. Gabriel said, you might be an old man, but I'm standing in the presence of God. God says, you're going to have a son. It's a done deal. It's done. See, sometimes you and I get stuck in the same place, don't we? Because we live by what we experience on earth. We believe sometimes the lies that the world gives us. God's not real. You you can't expect to have your sins forgiven. You can't know for sure that Your faith is the only real faith. You can't know that, see? Well, the angels, they don't buy any of that bunk. You know why? Because they stand in the presence of God, and they know that what God says He's going to do is going to happen. So we can know that our sins are forgiven. We can know that we have a home in heaven. We can know the grace and mercy of God. We can know it because we too stand in the presence of God. Now, On one hand, uh, Zachariah's question seems valid because him and his wife are really past normal child-bearing age. And, you know, of course, that means nothing to God. We see that over and over and over again in the Scriptures. On the other hand, he should have known better. He was too busy asking questions and focusing on problems to really hear God. Now he would have, according to the Word of God, nine months to listen. In verse 20 it says, And now the, the angel Gabriel said, You will be silent. And you will not be able to speak until the day, the day this happens. It's going to happen, but you're going to be silent. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Again, Gabriel had no doubt that what God said was going to happen was going to happen. Interestingly, Zechariah asked for a sign. And for nine months, he had to use sign language to communicate. Someone has wondered what the greater miracle is here. Elizabeth having a baby in her old age. Or for a preacher keeping silent for nine months. <laughs> okay, back to the account. The people are wondering what happened to him because he can't talk. He's going to be a new father and he can't even tell anyone. I heard a funny story about a man who took a vow of silence. And he entered into a monastery where the monks were allowed to speak only two words a year. After one year, the man said to the visiting, the visiting bishop, His two words were, bed hard. The next year, the bishop came back and his two words were, food bad. Another year passed and he said, room cold. At the end of the fourth year, he simply said, I quit. And the bishop said, well, I'm not surprised. All you've been doing is complaining for four years. (laughs) Okay. We pick up the story in chapter 1, verse 57. About nine months later, the baby is born. Zachariah is still incapable of speech. Eight days later, the whole town comes out to the circumcision ceremony because it's the baby's big day where he enters into this covenant community of Israel and he is given his name. Everyone assumes that his name is going to be Zachariah Jr. Uh, Elizabeth insists, though, that he is to be called John. 
And if you read the account there, the people are getting all worked up because the firstborn son was almost always named after the father or a relative. So John asks for a tablet, something he can write on. And to everyone's astonishment, he writes, his name is John. Actually, in the Greek New Testament, Zechariah wrote, John is his name. It's interesting because Zechariah now is believing. John is his name. John was always his name. John is the name that the Lord said to give him. And that will be his name. And that is his name. And then what happens next is absolutely incredibly fantastic. Just like Lou said, we have to be happy. This is exciting, giving this much money to the Great Commission Fund. This is exciting. What happens next? The song in his heart explodes with pent-up praise. For nine months, he's been thinking about what the angel said to him. For nine months, he's been thinking about the fact that the Lord has heard our prayers. I want you to think about this for a moment. And I've talked to so many of you who have given a word of praise to God for some incredible thing that God has done in your life. And isn't it something that when God moves in our lives, we're always surprised? Do you notice that? We shouldn't be. We really shouldn't be. But, but God has a way of surprising us. And, and, and all of a sudden, he bursts out in this song of praise. For nine months, he has probably been confessing a lot and repenting of the years before where he prayed and didn't expect an answer, where he became unfaithful because he hadn't seen God move. Can you imagine what must have been going through his mind? Doesn't it go through our minds sometimes when we see God move in a mighty way? All we can do is say, thank you, Lord, and forgive me for doubting. Forgive me for not believing that you were even hearing my prayers. Forgive me for, for stopping my petitions to you because I didn't think you were interested. Can you imagine what must have been going on in his mind? All of a sudden, he, he gets, he's able to speak. His, saw, his heart, his mouth explodes. Now look at this. The first words that he speaks, we're not even going to be able to get into the message this morning. <laughs> but the first words that he, speak are no, uh, he speaks are not directed even to his wife or to his family. He talks not about sports. He doesn't talk about Black Friday shopping or his hobbies. His first response is an exuberant eruption of adoration to God. And all his neighbors, by the way, are filled with awe and wonder. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he breaks out in prophetic praise. Now, I want to read this to you, and we're going to close with reading the passage of Scripture. It's, it's found in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 69. It says, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praised be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. I want you to get that. First of all, he has come and redeemed his people. Jesus wasn't even on the scene yet. But now Zechariah believes that what God says he's going to do is actually going to happen. Without seeing it, do you see what I'm saying? Faith. Faith is being sure, certain, that God is who He says He is and will do what He said He's going to do. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, as He said through His holy prophets of long ago. <clears throat> salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath He swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. Zechariah is saying that now, because of what God has done in his son, John, and what he will do through his son, God's son, Jesus, we are able to serve him without fear. Oh, that we might be a people as we go through this Christmas season not afraid to proclaim and serve our God. 
I hope when you're out shopping and somebody says happy holidays to you, you tell them Merry Christmas. Get, get Christ back in it a little bit. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, he's speaking to his son, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sin. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. We see so much in this song of praise from Zechariah. We'll pick it up next week, but I want you to get this this morning. Zechariah hooked his faith up, and the truth was revealed to him. And he knew that a Redeemer was coming to people walking in darkness, enslaved by sin. And let me say this this morning. Every person who has ever been born after Adam has inherited that sin nature. And whether you want to believe it or not, you are bound by sin and destined for death. It is only because of what Zechariah said about the coming one that we can have forgiveness of sin and walk in the light. And this Christmas season, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you just pray to God and ask Him to reveal His Son to you that you might find redemption, light, peace, eternal joy and happiness. That's the gift of Christmas. God sent His Son, gave Him to the world that we might be a people forgiven, redeemed, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb that we might have eternal life in Him. We're going to ask the worship team to come and close us in this song, O come, all ye faithful. Zechariah went and served that day expecting not much. And because he believed what the angel Gabriel said, finally he was able to proclaim the truth. Let's stand and sing this Christmas carol together. And if God has spoken to your heart, maybe you need a touch this morning. Maybe you need to come and ask God to show you the truth. You come as we sing this song. we thank you for the truth that Zachariah received that day in the holy place. Lord, your truth is revealed now to all of us through the word of God and your Holy Spirit's presence. And may we bask in that truth and adore the Lord in truth and in spirit as we go through this holiday season. May the love of Jesus be so real in us that people are drawn to him because we believe and live in the light of that truth. Dismiss us, I pray now, in your grace and in your peace. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said.
Amen. Thank you. Dismissed.